get disturbed with inaction and take uncomfortable, imperfect action today. People will buy from you, say yes to you, when they feel understood, not just when they understand you. So when I'm standing on one side of the ravine and I see where I wanna go on the other, before I even know how I'm gonna get in there, I know my why and I'm getting over there no matter what. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Dean Graziosi and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Have the not to do list. Create the not to do list. That's another training we've done. But when you start getting this vision, when you start understanding what your unique abilities are, what could cut you the biggest check and knowing where you want to go, you're spending the time here with me. When you know that, then it's time for you to make a not to do list. What are the things you should not be doing? There's too many. All of us are. I still do, but I make the list all the time. What are the things that don't serve you? Write them down. Because when you write down things you shouldn't be doing, when they don't serve that bigger future, when they're not in your unique ability, when they're not cutting you a check, when they're not taking you towards your bigger goal, that should be on your not to-do list. And remember in today's world, there's so many things that you shouldn't be doing, right? So when you make a not to-do list, I always write you can do four things. You can eliminate it. Um, Ariana Huffington is a good friend of mine. She started Huffington Post in her 60s and she sold it for $300 million. Uh, she said sometimes the best way to, uh, to uh, get things off your list and they should be on your not to do list is just quit them. Just eliminate them. You shouldn't be doing them anymore. Just quit. Sometimes a project that you've been working on for years, you're like, I'm just not doing that project because I'm not excited about it anymore. I was obligated, but I'm not obligated anymore. Obligation without commitment is a mess. Remember that obligation without a commitment is a mess, causes stress. Sometimes the best way to do it is quit it, eliminate it, stop doing it, time opens up. Next is delegate it. Do you know you could get virtual assistants? All my top students are using virtual assistants right now from the Philippines. Go to upwork.com. You can't believe four or five bucks an hour and you can get somebody for a few hours a week to do things that you can never imagine from virtually. They can do everything in today's world with technology. You have your food delivered, your house cleaned, uh, you know, take notes, do your taxes, you know, do, do, uh, stuff on the internet. They could build click funnels pages. They could make offers in real estate. My students have virtual assistants doing their real estate offers, uh, posting signs all over Craigslist, doing ads on Facebook. It's crazy. Four bucks an hour. The world has changed. Delegate it. Get a relative, a cousin. Stop doing the things you shouldn't be doing or automate it. The cool thing about technology nowadays, there's so many things we do, we get to automate. I mean, the extreme is I walk in my house and I can say, Alexa, play uh, Ed Sheeran radio. I feel like listening to that. And I'll listen to it while, and I'll go, and I'll look in the cabinet and there's no paper towels. I'll be like, Alexa, order paper towels. That's all I got to say. Next day, Amazon drops paper towels off the front door. It's insane. I didn't set it up. I had someone else, my, my wife or someone set it up, but I'm just saying the world has changed. Find out things that can you can automate that don't cause a lot of problems. It's not heavy technology, I should say, or replace it, right? So you can automate it, you can delegate it, you can eliminate it, or you can replace it. You make that not to-do list, what are you doing? What are we doing when we, you know, I'm tying all this together, a lot of you have heard a lot of these, but tied together to unique ability and biggest check, do you see how when you start doing more of what you're good at that puts you in flow, that gives you enthusiasm, and start saying no to the stuff that doesn't serve you, that someone else could be doing for a fraction of it. I mean, I write, I'm terrible. My words are from my mouth, but I mean, I'm terrible with spelling and grammar. I'm not gonna spend time to get good at spelling and grammar. I could send it to someone at Fiverr or Upwork and have them edit it for pennies in, in most cases, pennies. Why would I do that? My unique ability is giving you the messages and the words of going out and learning more, of gaining more wisdom so I can give you the tools so you can break through. That's where I spend my time. That's my unique ability. Rule number two, get disturbed. Get really disturbed because when we're disturbed, we move. 
You stand on hot pavement, what do you do? Do you stand there and go, wow, this hurts. You know, you run your ass off to get off the hot pavement because you're disturbed, because it's painful. Let the pain sink in. Get disturbed with inaction and take uncomfortable, imperfect action today, not next week, not when it feels right, now. Rule number three, be authentic. Do you wanna know one of the biggest secrets to sales in our world today, right now, where I, I believe where we're at, is authenticity. People just wanna know what's real, what's raw, and they want it from your heart. If you think about the people that you've connected with in your life, remember this phrase, people will buy from you, say yes to you, when they feel understood, not just when they understand you. I want you to listen to that again. People will buy from you, say yes to you when they feel understood, not just when they understand you. Let's take, let's take an example, and then I'm gonna circle back around with authenticity. So I'm gonna park authenticity, put a pin in it, and come back to it. But think about this. Think about, let's just say the quintessential sales area is used cars or new cars. And I know that world is changing, but let's just talk about uh, the way it was for the last 100 years, 50 years. Saturday afternoon, your car shopping, you pull into the dealership, there's 10 dealers waiting in the window, waiting for you to come in. You pull up, one of them gets a high five, your turn, go, go chat with the guy in the Tesla or whatever, right? Now think about this scenario. Same scenario, person comes up and says, Hey, glad, for, glad you're here today. Nice Saturday, right? Hey, listen, I just wanted to let you know, I've been selling these cars for 27 years. I know them inside and out. I've been voted the top sales guy 14 months out of the last five years, uh, and it's because I care about the client. This is what I do. And I can see you're here today, and you'd love a, a sporty car, but what, uh, let me guess. You want something that's a little good on the gas, maybe echo-friendly so you can do your part. I got this amazing two-seater, it's fast, it's echo-friendly, it's this, it's that. Let's go take a look at it. Now that's a sales guy that could make a job for 27 years and he wants you to understand him. But what if you went there that day because you, are, you just had your third child and you want your wife to have something that's not a minivan but the big SUVs are too clunky and you're just looking for something in the middle. Nothing even close. Now that same salesperson that wanted you to understand him, what if there's a salesperson that comes out and you see him walking over to you and you're like, oh, sh here comes a sales guy. You roll down your window or you get out and he says, hey, listen, first off, I know it's a Saturday. We all work on commissions. Authenticity, transparency. We all work on commissions. It's my turn up. I gotta, I get you. But I just wanna tell you, let me just back up. I just wanna ask, why are you here today? What's your family like? What, uh, how can I serve you? Tell me a little bit about you. And all of a sudden the person says, wow. Immediately, who do you have rapport with immediately? Sales guy number two because he, wanted, he wants the, you to feel understood, and probably not on purpose, that's just who he is. All of a sudden you go, well, we had our third kid, and you go, oh my God, I'm on my fourth, I get it. My wife hated the minivan. When I thought about bringing it to her house, she was like, are you crazy? But then I looked at the monster Escalade, and she's, that's a bus. But we figured out something in between. W would you be open to something kind of in the middle? It's kind of like the sporty, uh, smaller SUV. All of a sudden you're laughing, high-fiving, talking about the names of your kids, what's going on in school, they're playing softball or baseball and what they do, and all of a sudden you're sitting in the car going, it's a good guy. And what did he do most of the time? He listened. He was authentic. He was transparent. Rule number four, know your why. I do things the way I want to do. I want to make my own rules. I don't want anybody to tell me how, what kind of husband I can be if I want to take off in the middle of the day and romance my wife because we have the most rela amazing relationship in the world. It might sound boring to you or that sounds ugh, but that's me. 
I will fight for that. I will die for that. That is my why. Being a leader to my incredible team that's like my family. Learning and growing and help impact the world. Help unite us and lock arms so we can help shift the world. How do we change the global economy? By changing the economy in our homes. How do we change the global conversation? By changing the conversation in our homes. We are the change. We affect the change. No one's coming to fix it. To me, that's my why. I hope you can hear it. I hope you can feel it. It comes from my heart. So when I'm standing on one side of the ravine and I see where I want to go on the other, before I even know how I'm going to get in there, I know my why and I'm getting over there no matter what. If I got to get bloody, bruised up, fail, whatever it takes, I'm getting to the other side. Are you? Do you know the true reason why you're listening to this? Why you want another level? If you don't, go find it. I promise you when you find it, nothing will stop you. Not a brick wall, not a steel girder, not dirt, a mountain, nothing. A mountain won't stop you when you know your true why. So what's up, man? It's good to see you. I, I see you all over the place. I see you hustling. I see you impacting lives, doing amazing stuff on YouTube. I want to share whatever works for, you know, your following, my following today. But I want to share, dude, your book, Built to Serve, you are built to serve. There's a difference when... You know, this is, I've been an entrepreneur for, entrepreneur for over 30 years. I've been in the self-education industry for 24. It can't even seem, doesn't even seem possible. But there's a lot of people that when you kind of meet your heroes or you meet the people behind the book, a habits book, a built to serve book, a time management. It's like you, beat, you meet the guy with the time management book and he's late getting on stage and stressed out of his mind in the green room. Like, there's no congruency is what I wanted to say. And before we chat today, I just want to honor you and, and give you congruency. This, what you wrote in this book is really who you are, man. You are built to serve. You reach out to my team all the time and want to help with YouTube and tell us what we're doing wrong. And it's not, you're not doing it because of finances. You're not doing it because you're trying to get an edge. You're doing it just because this is who you are, man. So I love seeing you out there. I love seeing you grow. I love seeing the impact you're making. Cool, man. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm still working on accepting compliments, so um, I'll just say thank you. Oh, then I'm going to keep doing it through this entire thing to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, great. Classic Dean. All right, cool. Well, you know, I also in that story, um, you know, you've been really helpful in getting that book out. I remember when I came to Puerto Rico and uh, was trying to get feedback on pre-launch, you and Brendan Burchard took time backstage while you're doing your big event. People paid all this money to come there and you took time over lunch for 40 minutes to do a deep dive on my strategy um, and just super grateful that you guys did that and you hooked me up with your warehouse and you know a whole bunch of things that Dean, Dean's a big reason why the book is has, uh, uh, no, got just, out just a little wrong. piece, man. Just what's up, everybody? I see the highs. So listen, um, Appreciate everybody. I see all the cool comments coming in. So how can we deliver some value today? How, how do we help out? Besides, um, I, I do got to plug this. Like if you didn't check out uh, Evan's Built to Serve, you should check it out. Um, the truth is I'm not all the way done. I freaking love it. My biggest problem is every book I read, Evan, I listen. I, I, I have such a hard time reading. I still have dyslexia. It still doesn't stick. So it's taking me longer. But when I actually read a book, it sticks. So uh, highly recommend it. And uh, it, it just you. It's like it's it's having a, a 200 page conversation with you, which is which is always cool. Cool, man. Appreciate it. Well, we also I also have an audiobook version. I, I read it myself. So there's always. Oh, dude, audience. please send that to me. Rule number five, create a compelling future. You cannot create your compelling future until you decide what your painful future is. Because this will get you, this is, once you get around here, now all of a sudden, you're going up the loop. Like you projected, if I don't do crap, I'm going to be stuck right here. But now that I felt that way, what would be ideal? What would be ideal? What's a compelling future for you? For me, in my relationship, Tony, I'm going to give my credit to my boy, Tony. I've done all these things before, but he made me do it in front of him. Made me go in the other room and do it. I took a piece of paper when it comes to relationships. I made a line down the middle, and I put on the left side what was an absolute must in the next relationship I have. And on the right side, I put absolute unacceptable. And I literally wrote down things that, in my, I'm just being honest, I, I wrote down everything. I wrote down someone that loves my children. I know this will be hard. Someone who will love my children as if they're own. Someone who works on their personal growth. Someone who's a go-getter. 
someone who knows that we're flawed and we're all trying to get better. I just wrote down all these things that I was looking for. Seemed like it was too good to be true. And I put what was not acceptable. Someone who doesn't have a big heart. Someone who won't accept my children. Someone who wants to fight with my ex or fight with other people. Someone who likes confrontation. I won't accept anyone who doesn't you know, want to work on their health and their growth. I wrote all this stuff down. It seemed crazy. It was my compelling future. I stared at it and I looked at it and I felt so good and it gave me my true north. I projected being alone and, and staying the way I was and I also wrote down a compelling future. I write down a compelling future in my business all the time. Rule number six, push past the fear. You have a dream, you have a desire, and when you're a certain age, you stop that dream. Maybe you got serious about a job and people put their arm around you and said, you're finally growing up. I appreciate your responsibility. Really? I just threw my dreams in the toilet and you want to say you're proud of me? But it anchored that in. Oh, that's the right thing. My parents, my friends, my teachers. One more time. Screw that. They did it because they thought they were caring and loving you and that's not it. You have to push past the fear. Listen. I don't, I don't like to always use me as an example. Let, let, let me just share with Matt Larson, my top real estate students. Didn't go to college, got, actually got thrown out of college, tried one semester, they threw him out. Didn't have any money, grew up on a farm that, not his farm, his father managed another farm in a little tiny rented uh, place, worked on a farm, went to be a machine shop worker, worked 70 hours a week in a machine shop, lived in a 300 square foot apartment, did all the stuff I'm telling you, got my courses, spent a lot of money on his education, and his family came to him and said, are you crazy? Real estate's for rich people. You'll never be able to do it. His girlfriend broke up with him because he spent lots of money on the education and said, you're a dreamer. And he was re he called us to literally give everything back. And we said, did you even try? He's like, no, but, 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 but. All stories, all fear. All we said is, please go try it. That was like 35 hundred real estate deals ago, millions of dollars generated, lives changed. He's a partner of mine. He's a great dude. He went to a whole nother level. He employs 70 people. Do you know what almost killed him? Was the fear of believing all the sh for lack of a better word, he was told all those years. It wasn't the real estate skills. It wasn't the real estate market. It didn't mean that he, it wasn't because he didn't go to college and he didn't have money or was, he was in too small of a town or too big of a city or too hot of a market or there's no good deals or bandit signs don't work. It had nothing to do with that. He almost quit because of the fear of breaking through, of listening to all the crap. What about you? Anything like that close ever happened to you? Of course it has. You might be thinking it right now. Dean, you want me to write down what I'm good at? You want me to write down what I like to do? That's not going to make me money. That's not true. Completely not true. I, I, was, I had dyslexia. I barely got out of high school. I was a car mechanic in my 20s. Every day, greasy hands and painting cars and sucking in fumes. If somebody would have said, yeah, that car mechanic in there that's all dirty with his uh, mechanic outfit on, he's going to write multiple New York Times best-selling books. He's going to be best friends with Tony Robbins and Richard Branson. He's going to touch the lives of millions of people. You say, that guy? No, wait a minute. Wait. You're talking that guy over there. The one sucking paint fumes, painting the side of the car. Never. Right? So don't tell me wherever you are, you can't go to where you want to go. I'm giving you the keys. I'm giving you the principles. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish someone would have told me this stuff earlier on. It doesn't matter if you're 20, 40, 60, 80, or 90. Today's the day you could start. Today's the day you could break through that fear. Today's the day you can realize what my vision is and how I can start saying no to stuff so I can work on my unique ability, so I can go to that next level. Rule number seven, focus on what matters. Don't get consumed by the busy work. Don't lie to yourself. Everyone, right here, come on, look in my eyes. Stop lying to yourself. We all do. I'm not calling you out without calling myself out. I lie to myself. I BS. I'm like, well, I was busy. I had to do this and then do that and do that. All it was was my subconscious doing busy work so I didn't have to dig into the hard work that actually moves the needle and can take me to a place of solution, resolution, and next level. So really identify what the heck are you doing that's busy work and what are you doing that can actually move the needle to make you a better version of you, to create new revenue, to get the company going, to anchor in new success habits that actually shift your thinking so you can focus on what's right. How do you become the role model? How do you become the leader? That's, that's how you get your butt off the couch. That's how you stop procrastinating. Rule number eight, narrow down. When I was falling back into those beliefs, one thing, and I didn't, I didn't have this strategy then, but now that I look back, what happened is when I started to narrow it down, and this is the part I want all of you to hear, as you narrow down your niche and what you're going to teach, 
your confidence goes up and your ability for success goes up. We think bigger is better. It's not. In this case, the smaller the better. The smaller the niche, the smaller the thing you're going to teach, your confidence will explode and the ability to impact the exact people is so much greater, right? So what I was thinking is 7 billion people, that seems overwhelming. But then I said, well, you know, for what I was teaching, I could only teach people in America. So that gets a lot smaller. Okay. So now it's not 7 billion people. It's 300 million people in America. But I don't want to teach everybody in America. I only want to teach people that want to be in the car business maybe. That gets way smaller. It's like not the car business because what I thought about, I, I can't teach anybody with a new car dealership. I don't know how to do the financing and work with Ford or General Motors or Honda. I don't know any of that. Oh my God, that's people way over my head, way different. So it's not just people in America and the car dealership. It's the used car industry. So I want to help people in the used car industry. But then I started thinking, it's like, I, I can't help people that's got, that have like 10 dealerships or have sold thousands of cars. That's not me. I'd be a phony. I can't teach that. I just want to teach people how to sell used cars and just do a few to supplement their income. And all of a sudden, it's getting smaller. And I started thinking, okay, I can do that. I could teach the first person, somebody to do their first car, maybe do one a month and supplement their income because I know how to do this. But then I realized when I was really broke and didn't have money, I came up with one unique strategy that really helped my life. That took the niche all the way down to this little tiny dot. It was that dot right there. So I went from 7 billion people to people in America, to the car industry, to the used car industry, all the way down to the tiny dot of just helping people make a little bit of extra money by using this strategy to flip cars and some stress. And when I did, oh my God, when I did, everything changed. When I did that, my confidence went through the roof. When I did that, I didn't feel like I was an imposter anymore. I knew that if I had new people in a room, if I could get people to read my course, they just want to make a little extra money who weren't in the car business, not in the new car business. Oh my God. Then I sat down every morning and I was writing for that person. You guys feel that? I was talking to that person. I was writing headlines for that person. I was creating chapters and exercise for the new person. If someone was in the car business for 20 years, they probably would have laughed at my course, but that's not who I marketed to. And when I did, here's the crazy part. I got done with the course. I was obsessing on the logos and the pieces and I did, I had to do an infomercial. And the crazy part is I had no clue. I had no money. I didn't know where to start. Um, but that infomercial shifted my life. All of those things were happening. But when I narrowed it down, when I knew Tony Robbins served and shifted my life, when I knew there was people out there that could do a few cars a month or one a month or a few a year to supplement life, I knew I must. Rule number nine, turn strengths into income. I want you to look at things this way because there's two ways to look at this unique ability circle. Is as entrepreneurs, Consider yourself an entrepreneur or not. You're somebody seeking another level. John Baptiste in 1790 coined the frame, phrase uh, entrepreneur by saying, someone who takes one level of productivity to another. You want to take your income, your life, your health, your happiness, your joy to another level. To me, entrepreneur. I think, I think sometimes with that's uh, in today's world, for some reason, it gives it a bad name. Like, that's why sometimes you feel lonely. It's like, no, I don't want to do what everybody else does. I want to go after my dreams, my goals. I want to be in control of my life. If that's a bad thing, then I'll be on the bad list. But here's what Dan Sullivan, how he teaches us. As entrepreneurs, as success seekers, we've said yes to everything to get here. So we say yes to the things we suck at. We say things that we're okay at, that we're good at, excellent at, and Sometimes we spend some time in our unique ability. In your unique ability, you make $1,000 an hour. Is that possible? Of course it is. I'm gonna use real estate as an example. In your unique ability, if it's finding deals other people can't, and then finding buyers, buyers are easy to find, but finding deals, and you find a wholesale deal that takes you five hours total and you make five grand. 
Could you make a thousand bucks an hour? Absolutely. So let me just use that as a realistic number. That's in real estate. Doesn't matter what you're doing, what business you're in. Let's, you know, and if you're working for someone else, making a thousand bucks an hour might be an impossible thing. I know that. I'm just using this for reference. But think about what you do for a living, what you're good at, what you like, what could cut you the biggest check. If you were just focused in that, when I'm writing a book, with as many books as it sell, when I'm writing my book, I know I'm making a thousand bucks an hour or whatever that number is, right? So let's just say in your unique ability, make a thousand bucks an hour. And, and this, the things you suck at don't make you anything, but let's just say $10 an hour, okay? So for me, writing, teaching, educating, flipping, real estate, creating a new information product, those things, that's where I'm in my unique ability. When I'm training with you right now, this fires me up, it gives me enthusiasm. That's what I love to do. Uh, down here, trying to edit my own slides trying to edit my book. I write a long email and I try to edit it and I'm doing this, I'm wasting my time. Trying to create an Excel spreadsheet, trying to work on technology, trying to figure out everything on my cell phone. I don't know it all. I, I, I get one of my assistants to show me how to do things. Set up Siri at my house so I can listen to music. It overwhelms me, I get like, Ugh! I used to think, oh, I should know that, I should be smarter. Now it's like, nope, I'm not gonna do I, I have a house concierge, I'm, this sounds like I'm bragging, but what I've come to realize, if I work in my unique ability, everything below this becomes an ROI, a return on investment. So let's just say this is $100 an hour or a day or whatever the number is, right? Let's just say it's $100 an hour or $5, $20 an hour, $100, you know, whatever the number is here for you. But let's just say things you suck at is 10. Let's just say this is 20. Let's just say this is 40 dollars an hour. Let's say the things you're excellent at are 50 or a hundred dollars an hour you could be making. What Dan's whole point is, and you can look at this in a different, many different ways, lower in complexity or whatever. Dan's whole thing is when you peel the onion back and you get to where you can live in here, what you're good at or you like and the biggest check, right? And the biggest check, all of these become an ROI. Why would you do stuff at 10 bucks an hour when you can live here and pay that person? Or why would you even do stuff you're good at or excellent at or, or excellent at when it becomes an ROI? And I want you to, this is not anything that's going to happen today. I'm not saying you're going to do this today, but I want you to think about this because most people don't. Entrepreneurs are lonely. Entrepreneurs think differently than everybody. We make money different than everybody. We are, you're sitting here watching me. There's a million other things you could be doing this morning. Some of you might be at work sneaking this. I know it's the middle of the day. But you're here, you do things different than everybody else. You gotta start thinking differently. This isn't corporate structure. This isn't trying to evolve through the ranks. This is thinking in a creative way, outside the box, tap into your unique ability, tap into your own enthusiasm and authenticity, and think a little bit differently than everyone else. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is live in abundance. Would you care if your friends went to the movies and they didn't invite you? Would you care if someone was rude to you? Would you care if someone cut you off in traffic? How would you be to people around you? If it was rainy, would you say, it's a rainy day? Or would you say, oh my God, look at the abundance of this amazing rain. If a mosquito bit you, would it bug you? If you had a week left to live, you'd be like, oh my God, that little thing just kicked my ass. <laughs> and then I think about, and this is from the untethered soul. If, if a higher power, whoever you believe in, God came down and spent time with you, do you want to be the person that lets all those little things bug you, that lets, gets the angst, gets the, gets in the, you know, suffers? Or would you want to be the person that just is in a, living an abundant mindset, an abundant life? And I would love for you guys to take a few moments and not think of the bucket list stuff, but think of the things you would change immediately. What would you do if a really sweet, pleasant angel came down to deliver you the bad news that you had a week left to live? I think so much would change. I mean, there might be some bucket list stuff, but I know throughout a day, when I, when I think through that framing, nothing gets me off, especially in the last six months. Nothing gets me off track. Nothing gets me to be angst. And, and I have to tell you, I, I'm always high energy. I, I was always running away from my past and being homeless as a kid and couldn't read well and getting made fun of. Like I was always running from that. I always felt I had to run 100 miles an hour and I had to work all night and I could take on the stress. Something goes wrong with the business, give it to me. Something's wrong, there's a conflict, give it to me, I'll fix it, give it to me. And I'd hold it and I'd still, I'd walk around with a smile on the outside, but I knew there was this burning hole of anxiety and stress and worry about going backwards. And I thought for so many years that was my drive 
driving force. I don't want to go backwards. I'm scared. I, don't, I have this anxiety, but I can power through. And once I let that go, I, I was afraid to let it go, thinking that was my power. That was my superhero. That was, that's what drove me, and it was a lie. You can accomplish just as much with zero suffering. Now I've got some special bonus clips that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? When you just watch a video and you get motivated, the sign says you have a 35% chance of actually following through. That's not good enough, Believe Nation, and we need to take some action. But when you watch a video, you get motivated and you create a specific plan of action, that number jumps from 35% to 91% chance of you following through. And when you publicly commit to other people, like leaving a comment down in this video, your number jumps to 95% chance of you actually following through on the plan you set for yourself. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you. I wanna encourage each and every one of you to do the video you've been thinking about doing. To do one for whether you're in real estate, you're a lawyer, you're in life coaching, do a video to help sell what you do. Write a letter, write a sales letter, start your marketing, start your advertising, scale the company you have, finally start the business and stop overthinking what your marketing and sales copy and training is gonna be like and start living from your heart. People want real now more than ever before in history. With the way our government is, president is, people just want it like it is. I think we're done with the hype. The hype, we had hype in the 80s, we had hype you know, 15 years ago and we're having a hype now. No one wants hype, they want what's real. So I wanna tell you, there couldn't be a better time to scale your business, start your business, or use these same strategies with the people you work with so you can grow within your company. What stands between us and where we wanna go is never what we think it is. It's not the economy, it's not the president, it's not that somebody already dominated the health food industry or dominated Facebook advertising or dominated TV advertising or there's no room left. It's never that. It's always the story we tell ourselves on why we can't achieve that. And, and if, if I wanted to boil it down, I would just say, what is your biggest why? What's your biggest goal that you would love? If it was a year from now and we were sitting here, you're watching this and it was a year later and it was the best year of your life, what would be the biggest thing that would have changed in your life? It, from money, income, family, love, intimacy, being a better dad, mom, whatever. Whatever that is, if you say to yourself, I would love that goal. Like I, I'd love to have my company doing a million dollars a year in net profit so I could have freedom for my family. Then just say, but. And whatever that but is, is usually your story. It's like, I would love my company to be doing a million dollars yet, but I live in a smaller town and there's just not enough people to do it. Or the internet's so saturated, there's no room to advertise on Facebook anymore because everybody and their brother's on. Whatever that story is, is usually your story and that's the result you get. And that story is the, the thing, the thing standing between you and your next level. And, and I know people are watching right now going, oh, Dean, that's nice. You guys got money now, so it's easy. I don't have any money. I don't have a partner. I don't have any business experience. Uh, you know, this economy's not right for what we do. And, and you know, where there's, where there's you know, that old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. If, that, if your story is that, that's what you'll continue to get. So what I would say is, if I was gonna boil it down, is find what that story is. Now to you, you might be saying, Dean, you're saying it's a belief, it's reality. And maybe it's phase three, but reality is nothing more than our perception of a situation, right? We all know that. You've read that about, you've watched it on Tom's show, everybody has said it, but maybe this is the first time you actually think about it, that, that reality you think is holding you back is really just the story. So there's two things I say, is go find somebody else with that same story. Like go look at your, your, your evolution, where you were on your couch, no money, right? Go look at Richard Branson's story, look at Tony Robbins' story, look at you know, John Paul DiGiorgio or all the amazing books. Everybody, I've read every book in there, that's amazing, the people that you've got to interview and meet. But read all those stories and realize that first of all, that story you have is probably a lie, Right, So if you can find proof, like leverage, that it's a lie, that's one thing. But then the, the one that would get me is I love aspiration. I love to look and say, look what you did, man. I, I, I want to get there. If he did it, I can do it. But sometimes you need the pain as well. So what I like to do is I like to think, take that story and think it's five years from now. 
and think it's 10 years from now, and you're still in the same exact spot you are now. You're still worried, you still have envy, you still want more, you desire more, you wanna take care of your family, you wanna provide more, and think that that story, those two sentences, is the thing holding you back. Do you really wanna give that story that much power? And then think it's 10 years from now, and that story is still done, and all of a sudden, it like for me, I think, Am I gonna let that story stop me? I brought my son with me today. Am I gonna stop from giving him the opportunities that I didn't? I'm not raising, I have two children. I'm not raising entitled kids. I wanna give him massive opportunity. I don't wanna leave him a trust fund. I'm gonna leave him massive opportunity and train him. I'm not gonna let any story get in the way of me being that dad. And if a story pops up that says, hey, I can't make baseball this week because of this, I'll change the damn story. I'll fist fight with that story. And I'll look at the pain I'll have if I keep that story. So I love the aspirational part of this story will stop me from my new life, but I also like, are you gonna let that story screw you around for the next five, 10, 15 years? I mean, man, we're, we're gonna be 90 laying in a, in, a, in a bed looking up, like before we know it. And do you wanna think I squeezed all I could out of life or did I let just beliefs that other people gave me hold me back? Think about how many times in your life you had a massive win because you had no confidence. It doesn't exist, right? If you were looking to go meet that girl or that guy and you walked up and you're like, hey, um, you know, I was hoping we could, could I get you? No, that doesn't work. You walk in a business meeting, hey, do you think we could? No, that doesn't work. Go to talk to your kids about something in school, hey kids. Uh, no, you need confidence, you need the energy, you need to be alive. Well, if you know me and been watching my videos, that's me. I, I've made my career on enthusiasm and energy and being in the right state of mind, having the confidence, but you don't, the biggest myth is that you're born with confidence. No, I was the shyest kid in the world. I felt so insecure, felt dumb. I learned how to manufacture the confidence. And after 25 years of being an entrepreneur, generating hundreds of millions of dollars, being blessed to touch the lives of millions of people around the world, what I know for a fact is that you can create the state of mind and the confidence to live the best you, to unlock that inner hero. I love this phrase, I've been saying it for about six months, success tax. Yeah, I heard like, you say it earlier. You know what yeah. I love about that? Somebody told to me, I didn't make it up, but I found my own version of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, we all want to make more money. We all want to feel significance, mm -hmm. abundance, freedom, but most people aren't willing to pay it. So a great analogy I've been using mm -hmm. is, if you're in a band and you play the guitar and you write songs, it would be amazing to be at Madison Square Garden, 50,000 people singing your song, you're out in the front of the stage. I mean, could anything be more euphoric, yeah, right? right? But. Everybody would want that, but who's willing to play the guitar when no one's watching till your hands hurt? Who's willing to pack up an old shitty van that barely runs and drive to dive bar after dive bar playing where people are booing you? Most people aren't willing to put in the success tax to pay, and I said, I said, what if you just visualized, whether you believe in God, whatever you believe in, that there's an auditor, a success auditor, and you go, okay, Ed, Ed started with lives in a ghetto, okay, but he's still positive every day. Wow, he's still respectful. Wow, he tried that first business and his first partner screwed him over, took all the money and left. Wow, he still got up the next day, still inspiring other people, still not a jerk. Check, check. What if you gotta check off 10 boxes before you get to the other side? Because once you get to the other side, it opens up like Ed's amazing backyard. There's not many people playing at that level. Like everybody thinks it's so competitive up here. It's not, because you guys are all fighting over crumbs and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but. All I'm saying is when you said, like, put in the success tax, and know you're gonna fail, know it's gonna go sideways, but it's worth it. I literally flew to Arizona to, to meet a media buyer, and I said, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I just kept pushing in. Wow. And one of those things that I think during the evolution of growing from wherever you are to where you wanna go, is do whatever you do best. I mean, do whatever you're doing the best you can, knowing there's the bigger horizon. So I literally was working during the day on cars. I was a, I'd paint cars. I was doing really? collision repair at night. I'd go work on my apartments, and I was a plumber and and wow. and, and, and hung sheetrock. And I'd work till midnight on houses, and I was tired. But I had a dream. I knew I wanted to help people do better. So it made what I was doing okay because I knew there was more. Mm -hmm. So the big problem I see is people want more and they hate what they're doing. So that it, they're, they're, in a, they're in a state of mind where, God, I just, when I'm done with this crap, then someday I'll reach my dreams. And if you can flop that to go, no, this is the gateway to my dreams. I don't care that I'm serving coffee or I'm painting cars or I'm a teacher right now mm -hmm. or I'm on my sister's couch. Like this is what I have to do and I have to do it the best. Become a master at just this. Just become a master at yeah. that because, and that's the income and the security and the mindset yes. that fuels the next level. It's not, this is miserable, I hate it, I feel the next level and now I'm amazing. It's like, you need to 
to master that. Most of the time in our life, and I hate to say this, and maybe you've heard this before, maybe you know it to be true, and if it's the first time you're hearing it, I'm sorry to be the one to share it with you. Most of the time, our next level of life lives on the other side of our biggest obstacle. The thing we worry about, the thing we stress about, usually is the the, the little wall that once we get past it, through it, break a hole, and on the other side is our next level. So with that in mind, think about that. Think of your next level of life, your income, your business, your your success, right? You're on the Millionaire Success Habits podcast. That means you want another level of income, life, wealth, abundance, joy, right? That's why you're here. You can be doing a million other things. You're with me and I don't I don't take it lightly. That's why I want to deliver value. But if you're here, that means what you want, you want that next level. Well, if it lives on the other side of the, the wall that's in front of you, the obstacle that's in front of you, if you have a plan B, in some cases, that means you didn't burn the boats. You want to take the island, burn the boats so there's no other choice but for, ta- but for taking the island. If you want to accomplish that, a conquer or accomplish that next level of life, goal, abundance, start that business, take your new, your current business next level, finally stop listening to all the naysayers, tell your parents they're crazy, your friends they're crazy, all this, the, the BS that we have in life. If you want to do it, a plan B will screw you up because you go, well, if it doesn't work, I can go back. When you get to the wall and you start trying to climb it, I'm saying this wall is the obstacle between you and your next level of life. Obviously, it's a metaphor. But if you get to the wall and you get a little scratch on your hand, you can go, I can go to plan B. Uh, The boats are still in the harbor. Maybe taking this island's a little too much. No, what I want to shock you into thinking about today is if you've been dabbling for so long, if you've been desiring a next level, any area in your life, yeah, this is the Millionaire Success Habits podcast, but any area of your life that you're not having the breakthroughs, you're not having the success you want, the next level you want, that means most likely you have a comfortable plan B that's good enough. When you want to accomplish something big, something out of your comfort zone, that next level that you've been craving, then screw plan B. Make everything, all of your energy, plan A. Burn the boats, knock the wall down, go through the pain, go through whatever it takes and put all the focus is like, no, there's no plan B. This is, this is my life. You know, I know I've gone on stage in front of 10,000 people And I thought I should have more PowerPoint. I should have more reminders. And I just remember walking out and saying, I'm here to help rise these people up, to give them capabilities to change their life. It's my vision. It's my goal. It's my obligation to use my unique ability to just help these people and live from my heart. And all I could think about is changing these people's lives. And when I got out there, I wasn't perfect on stage. I I wasn't robotic and, and say the right things and I didn't have the crisp, clear PowerPoint. But when I spoke from the heart, it overcame all of that. And I get to be one of the best presenters wherever I go because I speak from the heart. Now you might be saying, Dean, that's your unique ability and maybe that is. But I know for you in life, there are circumstances where you have to prepare. You have to do a PowerPoint. You have to do a presentation. And I want to tell you, passion and from the heart always, always wins over over prepared and thinking from the head. Well, let me just ask you something. Right now in the in the crazy presidential race, the, the GOP race, you know, Ben Carson is probably the smartest guy when it comes to book smart out of the whole group. And I don't watch the news a lot, but I just read a lot. And somebody said this the other day and it just it just hit me. Someone said, man, Ben Carson is probably the smartest guy in that GOP race that's going on, whatever you think of it. And I'm not gonna share my opinion. But You know what the guy said when he was done? He's like, but we all know the smartest guy never wins. And I was like, wow. We all know that the smartest guy never wins? And what does that mean? And it's kind of what I'm sharing today. I'm not saying you shouldn't be smart. I'm sure, and so many of you are probably way smarter than I am. But what I want to tell you is enthusiasm and passion and living from your heart, to me, 100% of the time outweighs being overprepared and robotic and trying to think what to say. I I hope I'm getting the right message across today. I've had this question from so many people, how are you so easy to talk on camera on stage? And I, I never have a good answer and I really thought through it and that's the answer. I am here right now doing this video for you because each week I want to deliver you a nugget that you could just place into your life and make a tiny shift towards a better life. So I don't need a teleprompter, I don't need a script. I didn't, I I come here and just wanna deliver and it's coming from my heart. Now I have practice, I've been on video for 15 years, I've been doing these for seven, eight years and maybe that's not what you do but you're still gonna have these circumstances where you have to talk to your children, talk to your coworkers, talk to your employees and talk to your employer 
And if you get stuck in your head, that's when you get stressed, that's when you get worried, that's when you try to remember what to say and you leave and go, oh, why did I say that or why didn't I say more? What if you can go in and say, why am I going in and live with passion and have it come from your heart? Then that's truly you and you're giving the answers you're supposed to from the real you, not the facade that sometimes life makes us wear. So I, I hit it big in real estate by the time I was 26, 27 years old just by taking action, knocking on a million doors and finally got someone to do a no money down deal with me when I was 20 and then another one and I rolled that into the next deal and the next deal. And consistent was, action. Consistent action yeah, yeah. And, and consistent you know, failing and getting back up, right? Mm -hmm. it, the, the, the space between failures is really a huge determining factor of your success, right? It's like how, if you can fail fast, you can win quicker. I can remember being 15 years old and feeling different than everybody in my family. Mm -hmm. Like, no one made money. My dad, I, 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 at a really early age, I equated that hard work had nothing to do with success. Mm. My dad worked his ass off and he was broker than sh What did dad do? Uh, cars. Yep. Uh, collision shop. Collision. Yep. And he worked hard, got up early, paint under his nails, sick some days from painting and fumes. So I realized at a really young age that working hard had nothing to do with being successful. I had dyslexia. I, I didn't go past high school. I barely got out of high school and I knew I wasn't going to college. But I realized at a young age that, and, and somewhat being naive right before the world told you no so many times that yeah. I just I, I wanted to break out of watching my parents struggle watching all my family struggle yeah. again it doesn't matter where you are if the, the, the your surroundings feel complacent if they feel okay shit if they feel good and you want amazing you know you got to break through yeah. and I was just lucky enough to just stay persistent yeah. I wasn't afraid to fail I I I didn't doubt myself even though I didn't have the education, the money. David Kekage is a friend, a friend of a friend really, but I've met him a couple times, great guy, and he was paralyzed from the neck down. A guy that was into health and fitness and taking care of his body and living in a wheelchair, not being able to do anything for himself, he, he's thrived, thrived on a whole new level and does so much for innovating and helping other people with the same circumstances. But the reason I'm sharing this is because he did 30 Kekage credos to live by. If you want to live a joyful life, and this is somebody in a wheelchair now. Remember the obstacles he has every single day when he wakes up, can barely swallow on his own. I mean, think about that, right? So one of his credos is if you live life the hard way, it's easy. And if you live life the easy way, it's hard. And here's what I equate that to. We have to pick our pain. Think about that. Now, let's just use a silly analogy. Is working out easy? No, it's a pain in the butt. Going to the gym, it might be hard. It's painful, right? But not exercising and not working out. Will that be, pain, be painful someday in your life? Will it be that you're out of shape and you get heart failure? Will it be out of shape and you're overweight and get diabetes? Will it be out of shape that you don't have muscle tone and you break a hip someday? I mean, you might be young not thinking about that now, but living the easy way of no working out, can that be more painful? Absolutely. What about eating healthy? Can it be painful to eat the right food and not choose the greasy fried food and not get up and have a coffee and a donut and try to have green juices and great live green veggies and eat lean protein and, and do those things? Is that a pain? Yeah. And it's kind of hard. It's the hard way. It's the hard way, but it gives you an easy life. So you're full of abundance, joy. You, I mean, you feel healthy. You want to thrive. You can run. If you have kids, you can move. Or when you have kids someday, or you can live to see your great-grandchildren, right? So living the hard way, meaning do the right thing, eat the right food, work out. Maybe a little hard, but that's the path to an easy life. If you want to live the easy way now and not work out and eat terrible food, maybe it's temporarily easy, but will that give you long-term health? and satisfaction, and even if you make the money without your health, are you really wealthy? Heck no, right? But think about that also with your success. This is the Millionaire Success Habits podcast, but the foundation for success is if, if I gave you the tools to make money, but didn't share with you that you should be fulfilled and satisfied and healthy, then, then I'm just a fraud because it all ties together. If you got money out of the way today, the next thing you would be worrying about or thinking about is how do you live the best version of you? How do you be the best mom, dad, son, brother, cousin, you know, uh, uh, spouse, right? So I want you to think about it when it comes to your next level of income, next level of long-term wealth or starting a side business. The easy way is hard in the long run. The easy way is to settle for the job that you're in that, that's killing you. The easy way 
is to look for a magic money machine online and not spend time with your habits. The easy way is hope that someone does it for you. The easy way is to hope the government changes the rules and more money comes to you. That's all the easy way. And what do you do? You sit around and hope for years and years and years. And then you look back at the end of your life and time is gone. You look back at the end of your life and you go, you, I wish I would have gone after it harder in the beginning. So the hard way may be listening to podcasts like this, reading books like Millionaire Success Habits and, and all the other books that come from people that are actually doing it or get enrolled in courses or get involved in a mastermind or dig deep to find the research to know if you're in the right path, if you're in a future-proof industry or not. Yeah, that might be a little harder now. It might be harder now to wake up when everybody in your family tells you you're insane, when your friends and relatives say you should be happy with the life you have or people tell you you don't have enough money, you don't have the right education, you don't live in the right area, you don't have the right pedigree. You didn't get the right degree. You, people can all tell you that. And it's hard to overcome them. It's hard to overcome getting up and going for it. It's hard to overcome procrastination. It's hard to overcome getting sucked into social media. Go check your bank account and two hours go by going down rabbit holes of stupid things. That's hard. It's hard if you're in a relationship and the other person thinks that you should be strict and steady in your job and do the right thing and, and follow the rules. It's hard to step out of the line when 98% of the world listen to somebody else. They live a mediocre life. They live an okay life. Do you want to live an okay life or do you want to live an outstanding life? Do you want to live a good life? How's your relationship? Good. How's your health? Good. How's your income? Good. How's your job? Good. Do you want to live good or do you want to live excellence? Do you want to live great? Do you want to live an outstanding life? If we do, then David Kekich has it right. The Kekage credo that if you want to live the, the, the hard way now gives you the easy life. The easy way now gives you the hard life. How can you find the time, the energy, the effort, and the nerve to start to make that first call, to put out that first bandit sign, to put up a Craigslist they have, to start to 25 to 1, to call banks? How do you do that? Well, this one today is learning to say no. Now, one thing I've learned from the most successful people on the planet, if you want to say millionaires, I've been lucky enough to meet billionaires, the one thing I've learned, the more they say no, the wealthier they get. Now, you may have heard me say this before, but it's that important of a success principle. It took you a lot of yeses to get here. Yes to overtime, yes to missing your kids, you know, soccer or dance class. Yes to your wife, your husband getting upset because you're working later. Yes to getting my program. Yes to going to a live event. Yes to getting the education. Yes, yes, yes. Yes to your friends. You know, you, if you're watching this, you are the busiest people other people know. They say if you want something done, ask somebody busy because they know how to get things done. That's you. You're the person in your family amongst your friends. I know it or else you wouldn't be watching me. They could ask for emotional support, financial support, for a ride, for help, for advice. So you are used to saying yes. So this week, I want you to say no. I want you to make a list of the things that you must say no to so you can focus on you, so you can make a massive impact for your family. You wanna help family members that need money? Say no to them for a year, become an incredible real estate investor, and then if you wanna cut them checks, you can. If you wanna give more to your church, you wanna give more to charity, say no for a little while to so many things so your brain's not all over the place. We think we have ADD, most of us don't have ADD, there's just too much coming at us, and we say yes to too many things. So here's the assignment. What can you figure out to say no to this week? Because if you say no to things that don't improve your life, don't improve your family's life, don't possibly increase your future income, or put you on a path to the goals that you have to spend more time with your family, to get out of a job you hate, to pay off bills, I don't know what they are. But you have to make a, not a to-do list, but you have to make a, a list of what not to do. Who are you gonna say no to? Who are you gonna disappoint? What are you gonna let go? What habits are eating up your time? On your journey, you're gonna come across all new friends. You're gonna lose old friends for a while. You're gonna, you're gonna get a, uh, people in your life who love you that try to suppress you and they're gonna wanna hold you back. And here's the thing, you have a couple options in your life. You can let them dim your glow. They, you can let them turn down your fire or you can realize it's not their fault. So let me just ask you again, I wanna go back to this. Who in your life makes you feel bad about your dreams, your goals, your desires? Because those people are affecting you whether you realize it or not. When you have a desire for that next level, someone negative, someone uh, trying to protect you, tells you you shouldn't, you can't, you might say, no, I'm not listening to them. But even if 5% of that rubs off on you, 
then you might make different choices. You might play a little bit smaller than you need to. Your confidence could be crushed just a little bit more than it needs to be crushed. You know, confidence is a weird thing. Confidence doesn't go from zero to 100 in my eyes. Confidence, if your confidence is down 5%, you're screwed because you're going to play small. You're going to play safe. Do you think in today's world, do you think being good at something with most of your confidence is enough? Do you think being excellent with 90% of your confidence is enough? Hell no. You need to be freaking outstanding. You need to rock it with your confidence at 100%. And how can your confidence be at 100% if you're letting people in your life make you dim your glow, to lower your expectations, to play safer? Kaizen. Uh, the study of Kaizen is one step, one little piece at a time. That's how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you win or run a thousand mile race? One step at a time. When Japan rebuilt after World War II, they had to adapt Kaizen because everything was destroyed. They looked at everything gone. They couldn't imagine trying to rebuild Japan. But what did they do? They rebuilt it one brick at a time, one person at a time, one business at a time, and it turned into such a thriving country so fast because they adapted Kaizen. Break it up into small pieces. You got a goal? Take a bite today, this moment. When you're done watching us right now, go do something towards your goal. Go send an email, call somebody, say no, say yes. Look for a new job, start the company, just create the URL. If it's real estate, go make offers. Ever since that journey and starting before that with More Than Millions, I realized that people are searching like, and again, I, I digress sometimes, but everybody's in a vehicle, like your, your wealth creation vehicle, whether that's a job you don't like or a job you do like or a business you started or a business that's crushing or a business that's not doing great, you have this vehicle. And when this vehicle's not working, we're looking on the road of all the other shiny cars. And it's like, oh man, I, I tried selling stuff on Amazon, that's not working. I'm gonna go in the car business, the real estate business, I'm gonna go in the speaking business, the, the nutrition business, the supplement. And you're looking for another car to jump in. And I realized people jump from car to car to car their whole life, looking for satiation, looking for satisfaction, looking to make more money. And I got to see it firsthand Tom, because I was in the business of teaching people how to make money with real estate. And when they would call into customer service, when they would send in for a refund, or I'd see them at an event, they never said, ever, I tried your real estate stuff, it sucks. Never. We used to send surveys to listen, go, how come you're not making money yet? Is it, you know, the time, effort, energy, Dean's training sucks. 1% would pick the training sucks. And what I realized over all these years is that, and the reason I wrote Millionaire Success Habits, is you could literally give someone a business on how to sell $20 bills for five bucks, and they'd screw it up. Because of their beliefs, because of the fear of rejection, because of the fear of selling, because of the fear of marketing, because other people told them they couldn't, or they feel they need certain criteria, they need initials at the end of their name, like they, they need all these things. And at the end of the day, what you wrote, uh, uh, your impact theory, you call them beliefs? Yeah. Impact theory beliefs. It's kind of the same beliefs that are in my book, but it's also the same beliefs that are in three quarters of the books that you have in your shelf now and the incredible people you've interviewed. And I just saw that if we can give people, if we can go upstream, if you can stop jumping from vehicle to vehicle, the vehicle you're in might be the right vehicle, but you don't have the right habits or the right beliefs or the right rules, whatever you want to call it. My book's habits, so I call them habits. But it's really the foundation for success so you can overcome the obstacles. You don't let negative people in your life steer you in different directions. It doesn't, you know, uh, uh, even people will ask me about productivity. People say, how do, how do you get so much done? How do you run a business and still coach Little League and baseball and stuff? How do you do all those things? It's because of just simple success habits. like. I, I just wrote something on this recently. I said, you have to treat your decisions for productivity like binary thinking, which is X's and O's, black, and, black or white, yes or no. Is this moving me toward a better version of myself, a wealthier version, a happier version, or is it not? Successful people make, this doesn't serve that better version of me, I'm not doing it, right? So there's all these little rules, and I think, I think, and I know this, even when I met with Branson, I think people meet someone who's successful, People meet you and they're like, okay, what is it? Like, like there's this little, like, okay, nobody's looking. <laughs> Wah, and it lights up and like, here it is, right? And it's not the big thing. Like even when I was sailing with Branson, I'm waiting, like I wanted to say to him, so what is it? You know, but it's not. When I get done talking to him for three hours, he's got the same habits that you have, the same rules that you have written down on that plaque that's amazing. In my opinion, it's never the big things. 
It's all the little changes you can make in your life and none of them are, are dramatic at each level. It's like just following these little principles that have worked for so many years and you start putting them in your life and all of a sudden decisions start going easier. The money starts to change. The business starts to do good. The thoughts in your head start to project a bigger future rather than, a, than, a, than negativity. I, I, think it's the, I think it's the buildup of the habits or beliefs. I can remember thinking um, throughout high school and even in my early 20s, uh, maybe not my early 20s. I, I, I flipped pretty quick, uh, right around 20 years old. Mm. But you I didn't can, go to college, right? No, I didn't go to college. No, I barely got out of high school. Right. Um, but I can remember thinking in high school, whatever years that was, is that, you know, I, I hope someday I can get a job and make a thousand bucks a week and just get by. I'm not that smart because I had trouble reading. I still can't yeah, read great, but I, did, I have dis- had dyslexia is what I think it's been diagnosed now, but I still can't comprehend good when I read, but I didn't realize I was an audible and visual learner. I could listen Mm -hmm. to a book and I'll memorize the whole book. I can watch somebody on stage and emulate that if it fits my life. But sometimes we're judged by a scorecard that doesn't, it's an outdated scorecard, right? So not only did we not have money, I also felt, well, I'm not smart enough to go to school. Mm. And something changed around 17, 18 years old, just something flipped. And I just, I noticed, and this is going to sound like it's a pitch for the book and it's not, but I noticed the people in my town, this little tiny town, I grew up in upstate New York, the people that had money, the people that seemed happier, I don't know behind the scenes, but Mm. they seemed happier, more fulfilled. They were more relaxed. Like life just happened, like they were walking up a ladder instead of like, my family seemed like they were running on a treadmill. Mm. You know, it's like, we're going fast, but we're not going anywhere. So why is this guy and this woman in this town doing so well? And I remember just obsessing on it. Mm. And, and what I noticed it was, I didn't, I didn't call it habits. I'd love to say I figured this out when I was right. twice, but what I realized is they just did different things than my family and my friends were doing. And I just started obsessing on that. And I was young enough and naive enough to just think I could do it. Wow. You know, I mean, sometimes you wish you could give that gift to somebody in the twenties, thirties, fifties, seventies, right? It's, I had the gift of being naive and a little dumb and not listening to anybody. I mean, I was, I, in 1998, I did my first infomercial. Wow. And almost 20 years ago. Yeah. In 1998, Crazy. I filmed my first one. And my sister, my daughter's aunt, my daughter's sitting here with this. My sister drove from Virginia because by then, so in 1998, I had, um, I had an apartments. I had a collision shop. I had an auto sales and I was building houses. Well, you have this concept of protect your confidence. I've never heard anybody say it like that before. Yeah. Why is that so important? Well, because I think, I mean, in all the big decisions you've had to make along your way, have you ever made a good decision when your confidence was down? No. Once, like, can you say I walked in, my head was down, your, your <laughs> physiology's changed, you're like a little nervous. Like, you just don't make good decisions when your confidence is down. And, and, and I don't think it's like we're either confident or not confident. I think it's like if, if confidence is 100%, if our confidence is 95%, we play smaller. I know with me, like the big opportunities come. If I'm not in that like space, I'm like, you know what guys, let's just, let's hold, let's not, like I won't make smart decisions. So I think, I think we have to do everything in our power to protect our confidence. So that, that theory of protecting your confidence has been, has been a, a, a major thing in my head always. So I'm talking about these two and I've been blessed to meet presidents, multiple presidents. I've met billionaires. I, I've been lucky to meet a lot of people and I feel honored and blessed. But all of them have a kind of a humbleness of felt they weren't ready and not as good as you perceive them. Okay, I'll give you an example. Derek said he went to England to study and about four weeks before the world championship, his coach came to him and said, get ready. In two weeks, you're doing an, a, a competition. If you win that and qualify, you're going to the world championship. And he said, I'm not ready. Four weeks, I'm not ready. I, he thought he was going the year after. And she said, you're ready for it. He said he pined over it and said, no way, I'm not ready. And she told him. And the cool part is she ha- he had a good mentor. He had someone that became like a second mom to him who told him, yes, you're ready. Yes, you're ready. He went to that event two weeks in. He won that. He qualified for the world championship. And then he's like, I, I qualified there, but this is the world. Everybody from the world is coming in. I, I can't do this. I'm too young. He started going through all these excuses. And then like all entrepreneurs do. So I want you to know, we all think the same things you do. And all the things that are there are there for everybody. But one difference is, overcome your fear and step it up and jump in the game. Because listen, 
you know, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. He wanted to wait a whole nother year. When, they, when he went into the competition, they had him ranked that he would finish fifth through seventh. And he jumped in, he did the performances of his life, and he won the world championship, feeling he wasn't ready. Completely didn't want to do it. I mean, think about his, how his life probably changed forever forever and ever because he actually overcame that fear, didn't listen to that demon, those voices inside telling him he wasn't ready, and he got in the game. But what I have learned through the years, we all got in business for different reasons. Yeah. I, I wanted to be successful because I hated not being in control of my life as a kid. Mm -hmm. my, my parents were married nine times between the two of them. I moved 20 times. Nine times. Nine times. So never stability. You know, mm -hmm. get a new house, you got to leave. Go here, leave. Move mm -hmm. in with grandma. So I think... I, I hated the insecurity of my childhood, but it was my driving force. So thank you, God, the universe, yeah. whatever you believe in, thank yeah. you for that. Because yeah. it pushed me to go, hey, I don't want, I don't know about you. I, I, yeah. You and I hit it off in the first three yeah. minutes we right. were talking, but I'm not a control freak, but I don't want anybody to ever tell me how to live, me how to dress, what yeah. to wear. If yeah. I want to wear orange sneakers today, I yeah. want to wear orange sneakers. I live where I want. I raise my kids the way I want. Yeah. I don't get into peer pressure. I don't hang out with the Joneses or try to impress the Joneses. Mm. I just want to live my life. Mm. But I know that happened at a really young age. Mm. So backing up with your question is, that drove me. Hmm. So sometimes you need pain to drive you. Yes. And then you start being successful, then you can go to aspirational. Now I want to be a better dad, be yeah. a better man, be a better human. But if you need pain to drive you, let it drive you. Is there a, a formula to like the most successful infomercial, like five or six things that you must have? Yeah. You, you know, know, it's so funny. When I went dead before, when my brain, there was a thought I had and I ne <laughs> never happens because we just got off a plane. It might be the Dramamine. Um, <laughs> but I went flat for a second because what I was thinking, what I was going to tell mm. you is you said, how do you know it was going to work? Mm. And what I'd share with anybody watching in any kind of marketing or any kind of persuasion or any kind of getting someone, attracting somebody, persuading someone, get them to take action. When I look back at those original infomercials, I had two things going for me. I, I wasn't the smartest guy in the world, mm -hmm. struggled reading, insecure about that. Um, wasn't college educated. I don't have a really incredible vocabulary. It's hard mm -hmm. for me to articulate certain words because they just, they're not in there, yeah. right? But what I had was, is enthusiasm and authenticity. When I look back at those infomercials and they hit like monsters, I mean, one infomercial I did, one of the first sit down infor, inf, uh, um, infomercials I did, did 150 million in sales. Wow. Just one infomercial. And how long of a period was that over? About 18 months. Wow. It's amazing. And I look back at that and I don't say that to brag and that all that's not profit, you know. It's, yeah, right, of course. So I, you spend a lot of media in your Of course. Yeah, of course. And so I don't want anybody, I'm not, and yeah. I, I barely say anything about money. I'm saying that to make an impact mm -hmm. because I wasn't the smartest guy. I didn't go to college. I didn't come from anything. Most people watching are way further ahead than mm -hmm. I was when I started. You weren't trained on the have, camera. You right, weren't, but, yeah, yeah. But what I did have is I look back even at those old shows where I'm embarrassed to see myself and my New York accent was like super heavy. <laughs> that's where I grew up. Um, is I had authenticity mm. and enthusiasm. And I think people could see this guy really wants to help. It wasn't scripted, it wasn't perfect. I stuttered, I, I, I said words wrong. I mean, I look at some of those, mm. I use the wrong words in the wrong context, but it's still converted. And as I evolved, so I say, what's the foundation? Like as I evolved and I did the first time I did a sit down Larry King style infomercial, he's the one that gave me the mm -hmm. idea for that. Then I did the one where I was driving in my car. The reason I did that driving in my car is I wanted people to know that I wasn't using a teleprompter. Mm. There wasn't somebody scripting me. There wasn't a million cuts. It was me just wasn't driving. Produced. It wasn't yeah. produced. It was me driving from my office. I started it with a backpack. I said, I'm going home. You want to take a ride with me? And I talked till I got home. You, Brianna and my son were probably... Uh, three and one. When uh, I got to the door, they came running out. That no was the way. end of the infomercial. That's cool. Right? And, and that wasn't even planned. They just <laughs> ran out because dad was home, right? Wow. But I did that because I could tell the authenticity mm. and the enthusiasm I had to change people's lives. I want other people in my field to step it up and do better because it'll always keep me on my toes. I want my competitors to step up their game. When I get frustrated with my competitors, it's because they're slacking. They're, they're teaching five-year-old strategies. They're, they're not, they're hands off. They do an infomercial and let someone else run the education. I hate all that crap. I would love for them to be as good as us. I would love for somebody to get close to me because all I do is get more competitive and get better and better. Competition is great. No matter what you're doing, even if you hate it, realize it's temporary and be amazing at it. Mm. I, I, I sat down yeah. with um, John Paul DeGiorio, who started Tequila uh, Patron yeah. and, and uh, Sassoon, and he said he hated- well, His come to me a couple times this week. Go yeah, ahead, he said he hated, uh, he hated when he had a janitorial job when he was a kid. 
but he said, man, it was my job. I cleaned every, I used to, the, the boss came to him and said, man, I lifted up the desk. You cleaned under the desk. He's like, the guy thought I loved the job. I hated it. I just did it the best. And I realized one of my biggest, my first big real, my first real estate deal did over a million bucks. True story. I was fixing a guy's car and I'm in the collision shop. I'm gonna be completely transparent. I hated the collision shop. Mm. I ended up being the only painter because I got good at it. So every night when everybody left, I'd paint for three hours. The ventilation wasn't good. I'd have headaches. I hated every inch of it, but you'd never know. If you came in, you'd be like, that guy loves being in the collision mm. shop. Mm. I knew it was temporary. Mm. Because don't think I'm just gonna schlub through this job and then my, my magic will come. You'll be screwed. You'll stay there because how you do one thing is how you do everything. Mm. So, I, so I'm literally in the collision shop I have this guy he comes down he's like my god my car looks great thank you so much we get talking come kind of friends really quick yeah. and he says what are you up to I'm like well I'm doing this but I'm working on my day job my night job is real estate mm -hmm. I'm gonna be I'm gonna take real estate to a whole nother level he's like what do you got going on at that time I was working on a deal for hundred eighty thousand dollars to buy an old vineyard okay. and I didn't have the money I scraped up every credit card I had I came up with like 45 grand the seller agreed to sell it to me for half down and half in two years. I needed 45 grand. I tell this guy the story, I said, but I'm gonna get it. He goes, yeah, you're gonna get it because I'm going home to get it for you. Oh my gosh. Now what if I was like, oh, I hate collision. Yeah, here's your keys. Yeah. Ah. I made a million dollars on that deal. Oh, the first one ever awesome. documented. I, I sold that property. I killed it on that property. Killed it. What all, a great all the story. neighbors, all the neighbors didn't want me to build on the property, and I was fighting them. And then I realized, wow, what if I sell it to them? So I sold them all a piece <laughs> around, and I crushed it. That's a I great killed it. Story. So that's the first thing. Yep. So no matter what you're doing, find a way to be enthusiastic, knowing that maybe the universe, God, whatever mm. you believe, is putting you through your trial run mm. to to deserve that. And then the next thing, I love this phrase. I've been saying it for about six months. Six Success tax. If you want even more Dean Graziosi, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. When you change your mindset on money, when you gain the capabilities, and when you take action, it is, in my opinion, you could disagree with me, in my opinion,